Understanding the psychology of the self can mean the difference between success and failure, love and hate, bitterness and happiness. The discovery of the real self can rescue a crumbling marriage, recreate a faltering career, transform victims of personality failure. On another plane, discovering your real self means the difference between freedom and the compulsions of conformity. Here is another illustration of how the self-image operates. Picture yourself living inside two boxes, one smaller than the other. The bigger box, farthest away from you, represents real or realistic limits. The box within, the smaller one that is tightly confining yourself, represents self-imposed limits. The area between the two boxes is your area or range of underutilized potential. As you discover the means of strengthening and liberating your self-image, you expand the smaller box, bringing it closer to the size of the larger one, permitting greater use of your true. A revolution in psychology began in the late 1960s and exploded in the 1970s. When I wrote the first edition of Psycho-Cybernetics in 1960, I was at the forefront of a sweeping change in the fields of psychology, psychiatry, and medicine. New theories and concepts concerning the self began emerging from the work and findings of clinical psychologists, practicing psychiatrists, and even cosmetic or so-called plastic surgeons like myself. Welcome back to the flight. Hit that subscription button, buddy, and stay updated with everything that's trending in Guyana and the diaspora. Thanks. Like this one up. Like this video. Why are you liking this video up? Because every single person person that call itself a Guyanese that did not read this book yet or even if you read it because you know how much of a good read it is if you read it before need to read this again or need to come in contact with this video and share it with a person so that it will expand their horizons and expand their perspective and their self-image you know why because the self-image the world image of the country that we call Guyana has changed tremendously in the last couple of years and the people that live there need to catch up if they haven't already with that image that is now being redefined in this world that we live in right now. A revolution in psychology began in the late 1960s and exploded in the 1970s. When I wrote the first edition of Psycho-Cybernetics in 1960, I was at the forefront of a sweeping change in the fields of psychology, psychiatry, and medicine. New theories and concepts concerning the self began emerging from the work and findings of clinical psychologists, practicing psychiatrists, and even cosmetic or so-called plastic surgeons like myself. New methods growing out of these findings resulted in dramatic changes in personality, in health, and even in basic abilities and talents. Chronic failures became successful. F students changed into straight A pupils with no extra tutoring. Shy, retiring, inhibited personalities became happy and outgoing. At the time, I was quoted in the January 1959 issue of Cosmopolitan magazine, in which T.F. James summarized these results obtained by various psychologists and MDs as follows. Quote, Understanding the psychology of the self can mean the difference between success and failure, love and hate, bitterness and happiness. The discovery of the real self can rescue a crumbling marriage, recreate a faltering career, transform victims of personality failure. On another plane, discovering your real self means the difference between freedom and the compulsions of conformity." Unquote. This was barely predictive of everything that has occurred in the four decades that followed. When Psycho-Cybernetics was first published, if you visited a bookstore to obtain a copy, you might have found it nestled on an obscure shelf with only a dozen or so other so-called self-help books. Today, of course, self-help is one of the largest sections in the entire bookstore. Psychologists, psychiatrists, and therapists have proliferated. New specialists have emerged, such as sports psychologists and corporate performance coaches. And the stigma of seeking such help has disappeared to such an extent that in some circles doing so is trendy. Self-help psychology has become so popular it even has found a place in television infomercials. Once difficult, now easy. 
I'm gratified that much of this modern explosion of ideas, information, and people to assist you with everything from conquering procrastination to shaving strokes off your golf score appears to be based on psychocybernetics. You might say that my original work was ahead of its time, or you might say that it has aged well. Whatever you conclude, the most important thing for you, personally, is that the fundamental promise of psychocybernetics has been proven true beyond any doubt or argument. That is, once difficult, now easy. Whatever is now difficult for you, whatever may have prompted your listening to this program, can be transformed from difficult to easy through the use of certain sound psychological concepts, easily understood and mastered mental training techniques, and a few practical steps. Your Secret Blueprint I would argue that the most important psychological discovery of modern times is the discovery of the self-image. By understanding your self-image, and by learning to modify it and manage it to suit your purposes, you gain incredible confidence and power. Whether we realize it or not, each of us carries within us a mental blueprint or picture of ourselves. It may be vague and ill-defined to our conscious gaze, in fact it may not be consciously recognizable at all, but it is there, complete, down to the last detail. This self-image is our own conception of the sort of person I am. It has been built up from our own beliefs about ourselves. Most of these beliefs about ourselves have unconsciously been formed from our past experiences, our successes and failures, our humiliations, our triumphs, and the way other people have reacted to us, especially in early childhood. From all these, we mentally construct a self, or a picture of a self. Once an idea or a belief about ourselves goes into this picture, it becomes truth, as far as we personally are concerned. We do not question its validity, but proceed to act upon it just as if it were true. The self-image then controls what you can and cannot accomplish, what is difficult or easy for you, even how others respond to you, just as certainly and scientifically as a thermostat controls the temperature in your home. Specifically, all your actions, feelings, behavior, even your abilities, are always consistent with this self-image. Note the word always. In short, you will act like the sort of person you conceive yourself to be. More important, you literally cannot act otherwise, in spite of all your conscious efforts or willpower. This is why trying to achieve something difficult with teeth gritted is a losing battle. Willpower is not the answer. Self-image management is. The Snapback Effect The person who has a fat self-image, whose self-image claims to have a sweet tooth, to be unable to resist junk food, who cannot find the time to exercise, will be unable to lose weight and keep it off no matter what he tries to do consciously in opposition to that self-image. You cannot long outperform or escape your self-image. If you do escape briefly, you'll be snapped back, like a rubber band extended between two fingers coming loose from one. The person who perceives himself to be a failure-type person will find some way to fail, in spite of all his good intentions or his willpower even if opportunity is literally dumped in his lap. The person who conceives himself to be a victim of injustice, one who was meant to suffer, will invariably find circumstances to verify his opinions. You can insert any specific into this, your golf game, sales career, public speaking, weight loss, relationships. The control of your self-image is absolute and pervasive. The snapback effect is universal. The self-image is a premise a base or a foundation upon which your entire personality, your behavior, and even your circumstances are built. As a result, our experiences seem to verify and thereby strengthen our self-images, and either a vicious or a beneficent cycle, as the case may be, is set up. For example, a student who sees himself as an F-type student, or one who is dumb in mathematics, will invariably find that his report card bears him out. He then has proof. In the same manner, a sales professional or an entrepreneur will also find that her actual experiences tend to prove that her self-image is correct. Whatever is difficult for you, whatever frustrations you have in your life, they are likely proving and reinforcing something ingrained in your self-image like a groove in a record. Because of this objective proof, it very seldom occurs to us that our trouble lies in our self-image or our own evaluation of ourselves. Tell the student that he only thinks he cannot master algebra, and he'll doubt your sanity. He has tried and tried, and still his report card tells the story. 
Tell the sales agent that it's only an idea that she cannot earn more than a certain figure, and she can prove you wrong by her order book. She knows only too well how hard she has tried and failed. Yet as we shall see, almost miraculous changes have occurred, both in grades of students and the earning capacity of salespeople, once they were prevailed upon to change their self-images. Obviously, it's not enough to say, it's all in your head. In fact, that's insulting. It is more productive to explain that it is based on certain ingrained, possibly hidden patterns of thought that, if altered, will free you to tap more of your potential and experience vastly different results. This brings me to the most important truth about the self-image. It can be changed. Numerous case histories have shown that you are never too young or too old to change your self-image and start to live a new, amazingly different life. Here is another illustration of how the self-image operates. Picture yourself living inside two boxes, one smaller than the other. The bigger box, farthest away from you, represents real or realistic limits. The box within, the smaller one that is tightly confining yourself, represents self-imposed limits. The area between the two boxes is your area or range of underutilized potential. As you discover the means of strengthening and liberating your self-image, you expand the smaller box, bringing it closer to the size of the larger one, permitting greater use of your true potential. Success from the inside out, not the outside in. One of the reasons it seems so difficult for a person to change habits, personality, or a way of life has been that nearly all efforts at change have been directed to the circumference of the self, so to speak, rather than to the center. Numerous patients have said to me something like the following. If you're talking about positive thinking, I've tried that before and it just doesn't work for me. However, a little questioning invariably brings out that these individuals employed positive thinking or attempted to employ it, either on particular external circumstances or on some particular habit or character defect. I will get that job. I will be more calm and relaxed in the future. This business venture will turn out right for me, and so on. But they never thought to change their thinking of the self that was to accomplish these things. Jesus warned us about the folly of putting a patch of new material on an old garment or of putting new wine into old bottles. Positive thinking cannot be used effectively as a patch to the same old self-image. In fact, it is literally impossible to really think positively about a particular situation as long as you hold a negative concept of self. Numerous experiments have shown that once the concept of self is changed, other things consistent with the new concept of self are accomplished easily and without strain. A system of ideas. One of the earliest and most convincing experiments along this line was conducted by the late Prescott Lecky, one of the pioneers in self-image psychology. Lecky conceived of the personality as a system of ideas, all of which must be consistent with each other. Ideas that are inconsistent with the system are rejected, not believed, and not acted on. Ideas that seem to be consistent with the system are accepted. At the very center of this system of ideas, the keystone or the base on which all else is built is the individual's self-image or his conception of himself. Lecky was a school teacher and had an opportunity to test his theory on thousands of students. He theorized that if a student had trouble learning a certain subject, it could be because, from the student's point of view, it would be inconsistent for him to learn it. Lecky believed, however, that if the student could be induced to change his self-definition, his learning ability should also change. This proved to be the case. One student, who misspelled 55 words out of 100 and flunked so many subjects that he lost credit for a year, made a general average of 91 the next year and became one of the best spellers in school. A girl who was dropped from one college because of poor grades entered Columbia and became a straight-A student. A boy who was told by a testing bureau that he had no aptitude for English won honorable mention the next year for a literary prize. The trouble with these students was not that they were dumb or lacking in basic aptitudes. The trouble was an inadequate self-image. I don't have a mathematical mind. I'm just naturally a poor speller. They identified with their mistakes and failures. Instead of saying, I failed that test, which is factual and descriptive, they concluded, I am a failure. 
Instead of saying, I flunked that subject, they said, I am a flunk out. For those who are interested in learning more of Lecky's work, try to find a copy of his book, Self Consistency A Theory of Personality. This book, Psycho Cybernetics. This book, Psycho Cybernetics, man, take a second. If you haven't already, please like the video, like the video, thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up the video, thumbs up this video, and boost it in the algorithm. It's a very small thing for you, but a very, very large thing for us. Thank you very much. This book, this book, man. Look, there's stuff in this book that I would read, right? I read this book, I would say, in my early 20s, right? And there's stuff in this book that I realized that I was being taught and that very impactful people in my life were showing it to me throughout my early teens and my late teens. Now, I don't know who, if any person in this video has had the pleasure of studying with Sir Patterson, one of the best maths teachers that Guyana, my perspective, has ever had. Sir Patterson he used to have lessons in North Rumbelt on Arby Barker Road and he used to have lessons other places as well. He was one of the best maths teachers in the country. He would even go to the part of the Caribbean, whichever island it was at that time, I'm pretty sure it might have been either Jamaica or Barbados, and he would be a part of the team that was marking the CXC papers at that time. So he was one of the best teachers at that time, Sir Patterson. I don't know if anybody was there, but if you had the pleasure of studying with him, you would realize just what I'm saying right now. He would change your mind from thinking that you couldn't learn maths into thinking in a whole new way and realizing just how simple and how easy it was for you to understand some of the things that you thought was so complicated before when it came down to mathematics. And then I now was able to take that and apply it to other things in my life. He was very impactful and he was teaching me techniques of psycho-cybernetics way back in Guyana, way before I even came in contact with this book. Big up yourself, Pato, wherever you're there. And definitely, I didn't turn out to be a lunt. <laughs> All right. Now, how are you defining the man or the woman in the mirror? Is he a good spouse? Is he a good parent? Right? Who is she? Is she an asset, a great friend, one of the smartest persons you know? How are you interacting with yourself and who's defining this self for you? When is the last time you check your self image? Psycho Cybernetics. This book, man, it's one of the most impactful books because when you check your self image, when you check your self image and what, who, when, where, and why is defining it, you now are able to crop yourself into the best aspect of the reality you want to live. Right now, look at the three people on the screen. You're going to see why, why I use these three people in this thumbnail. is because these three people they consciously redefine their self-image into something that is greater and more focused every single time. If you look at it, they redefine themselves. If you contemplate Critic and contemplate Mudwater and Otisha, you would see that the three of them consciously and masterfully crafted the self-image that they now harness and reap the benefit from in every possible step in this thing that we're calling life. Redefine themselves into the aspect of them that they wanted the world to know, right? That they wanted the world to experience and then they used it to achieve the things that we now look at them and say, wow, this is a great person with these great achievements because they harnessed that self-image psycho cybernetics check it out when you get a chance let's have a conversation about this in the comment section you ever read it before and if so what are some of the best parts and some of the best things that you would have gathered from reading it and if you haven't man trust me check it out 
Google search it, search it on YouTube, and then check out a couple parts. Let's have a conversation about this part that I just played. And thanks again for watching. One love. And I'll catch you in the next flight. Do remember, like the video. Thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up the video. And if you haven't already, make sure you get a return flight ticket by hitting that subscribe button. I'll catch you in the next flight. She's ready. Stay ready. Mr. The ultimate male supplement. Men's total wellness formula. Packed with essential nutrients for men's health. She'll call you Mr. C. If Al Capone, Two-Gun Crowley, Dutch Schultz, and the desperate men and women behind prison walls don't blame themselves for anything, what about the people with whom you and I come in contact? John Wanamaker, founder of the stores that bear his name, once confessed, I learned 30 years ago that it is foolish to scold. I have enough trouble overcoming my own limitations without fretting over the fact that God has not seen fit to distribute evenly the gift of intelligence.